Hello, this video is sponsored by In60 Learning. More on that later, and now without further ado, let's get started. The year is 1957, and Laika, the first animal in space, orbits the Earth. Howard Macmillan takes over as Prime Minister after Anthony Eden's resignation. Also in 1957, gave birth to Sid Vicious, Stephen Fry and Martin Luther King III. A little known place on the Cumbrian coast would be indelibly etched into world history. Nearly 30 years before the disaster at Chernobyl that left Pripyat an abandoned ruin, a fire nearly caused a similar outcome. The event left a legacy of contamination and cancer in its wake. Later estimates would count of 240 linked cases of thyroid cancer. The Windscale Fire would be considered as one of the worst nuclear incidents in history, until 22 years later at Three Mile Island. Many lessons would be learnt from Windscale, as the true dangers of nuclear power became apparent, and the event would weather away the optimism of its promising new power source called nuclear. Windscale started out as ROF Sellafield in 1942 as an ordnance factory at Low Sellafield, a remote and isolated site on the coast, built there due to the hazardous materials set to be made on the site. After the surrender of Japan, the factory was closed down and ownership was briefly handed over to Courtaulds for the use as a textile factory. However, the site was reacquired by the Ministry of Supply for the use of the creation of nuclear materials for the United Kingdom's atomic weapons programme, and construction began in 1947. At this time, the site was renamed Windscale. The project took over 5,000 workers to complete and created two air-cooled open-circuit graphite-moderated reactors known as Pile 1 and Pile Number 2, completed in 1950 and 1951 respectively. Each pile was housed inside concrete buildings just a few hundred feet apart. The core of the reactors had a large block of graphite with channels drilled for it for the fuel cartridges. Each cartridge had a uranium rod encased in an aluminium canister to protect it from the air, as uranium can become highly reactive when hot and runs the risk of catching fire. The uranium rods were inserted in the front of the core, with new rods being added at even intervals. This pushed the other cartridges in the channels towards the rear of the reactor, eventually causing them to fall out the back into a water tank where they could be collected. The design of the piles took cue from the Manhattan Project. However, the design used a passive air system to cool the core instead of water to reduce the risk of a loss of coolant accident. Each pile had a chimney used to pull air out of the core, cooling the cartridges. For additional cooling, fans were used to blow air out of the chimneys. A design flaw became apparent that a cartridge could come out of the back of the core and miss the water tank, and hit the floor causing a fire and run the risk of releasing deadly uranium oxide into the air to be blown out by the chimney's fans. This potential flaw caused the project leader Sir John Cockcroft to order filters to be added to the chimneys. Because of the cost and effort needed to fit the filters, they gained the name Cockcroft's Folly. The site was developed further through the 1950s, with Magnox reactors constructed across the river at Calder Hall. Once the plant became active, the issue of cartridges missing the water tank was realised more than anticipated, so much so that staff had to regularly walk the core, sweeping the used cartridges into the cooling channel. Some cartridges even got caught inside the core, bursting open. Testing showed that radiation levels around the plant and nearby village had risen, but this information was kept secret. On the 7th of October 1957, staff working on Pile 1 noticed that the core's temperature had risen higher than normal. To counteract this, a Wigner release was ordered, which heated up the core evenly. This release had been done eight times in the past. The core did not heat up evenly, and as some parts started to cool down, channel 2053 began to increase in temperature. Another release was ordered on the 8th. This time the heat rose evenly and was deemed a success. However, in the morning of the 10th, the core didn't cool down as predicted after a Wigner release. Reaching 400 degrees centigrade, the engineers ordered the cooling fans to be sped up. The radiation detectors in the chimneys recorded high levels of contaminants. It was assumed that a cartridge making its way through the core had split open. This had happened before, but the assumption was wrong. I'm sure you all love learning about interesting topics, as you're watching a plainly difficult video after all. So I wanted to tell you about In60 Learning. 
They produce masterfully crafted books, ebooks, and audiobooks that you can enjoy in just 60 minutes. And if you're like me, that's pretty useful as there are definitely not enough hours in the day. My favourite in 60 learning volumes so far are Jesse James the Infamous Outlaw, which I listened to on audio, and Leland Stanford, The Double Life of a Railroad Tycoon, which I read recently. I especially like the audio since I can multitask when I'm walking my dog, on the commute, or like recently on a road trip. In the description you'll find a link to the learning list where you'll get the first two sections of Alexander the Great, student of Aristotle, descendants of heroes, for free. Channel 2053, the source of the uneven heat, didn't have a split cartridge but instead had a cartridge on fire. Due to the fans speeding up, the fire spread to other channels and radiation levels increased further still. Staff outside the plant could see smoke coming out of the chimney of Pile 1. As the heat rose in the core, the operating staff began to realise that the core had actually caught fire. Tom Hughes, the assistant reactor manager and another member of staff, put on protective clothing and went to personally inspect the face of the core. Hughes later said in an interview, We saw, to our complete horror, four channels of fuel glowing bright cherry red. Tom Chuoy, the reactor manager, then climbed the reactor building in full protective equipment to inspect the reactor exit, where he too saw glowing fuel. The reactor operators tried to call the core by turning the fans to maximum speed, but this again fanned the flames. Tom Chuoy suggested pushing some of the burning cartridges out of the reactor by using scaffolding poles. However, by this time, the core was white hot and the cartridges were impossible to move. One of Hugh's colleagues would later say, it was just white hot, nobody, I mean nobody can believe how hot it could possibly be. Carbon dioxide was ordered from Calder Hall's reactors to try and suffocate the flames, but the attempts were inefficient as sufficient quantities could not be administered to the cores. By the 11th, 11 tons of uranium were on fire with temperatures recorded at 1300 degrees centigrade, and the reactor core was close to collapse. Chuhoi suggested using water to douse the flames, but this plan was risky as water could react with the oxidising molten metal leaving pure hydrogen and essentially having the ingredients for an explosion. With no other choices, Choi ordered the water to be used. Several hoses had their nozzles cut off and directly placed inside the channels of the core, one metre above the heart of the fire. Choi once again climbed the reactor to observe the water and to check for signs of the water's hydrogen reacting with the core. Unfortunately, the plan didn't pay off and the water failed to extinguish the fire. The decision was then taken to shut off the air cooling and the vents to the reactor. Chuoi ordered everyone out of the reactor building except himself and the fire chief. Once again, Chuoi climbed the reactor building to report on the state of the fire. Gradually, the flames started to subside. The inspection plates used to view parts of the core were unopenable. This was due to the fire trying to suck as much air in as possible to keep burning. Chuoi later said, I have no doubt it was even sucking air through the chimney at this point to try and maintain itself. The first flames went, then the flames reduced and the glow began to die down. I went up to check several times until I was satisfied that the fire was out. I did stand to one side, sort of hopefully, but if you're staring right into the core of a shut down reactor, you're going to get quite a bit of radiation. The fire was finally out, but water kept on pumping through the core for another 24 hours until it was stone cold. The fire released 20,000 curies of iodine-131, 594 curies of cesium-137, and 324,000 curies of xenon-133. Although this number has been disputed to be higher, it would have been even higher if it wasn't for the filters known as Cockcroft's Folly. Radioactive materials sped across UK and Europe. The dispersal of iodine-131 was linked to cancer, even though it only has a half-life of 8 days but the way the human body consumes the material is by storing it in the thyroid. Around 2 million litres of milk from 500 kilometres squared was destroyed by dilution and eventually dumped in the Irish Sea. However, no one was ever evacuated from the surrounding areas. The effects of the event were played down by the British government as at the time plans were set by Prime Minister Macmillan and the US President Dwight D. Eisenhower of having a joint nuclear weapons project. 
Unfortunately, due to the government's wanting to sweep the event under the rug, many of the staff that played a key role in preventing a much larger disaster went unnoticed. Even though Tom Chuoi had taken on one of the most dangerous jobs by personally viewing the reactor and its molten fuel cartridges, his exposure to radiation didn't cause many long-term effects as he lived to a ripe old age of 90. The wider windscale site was decontaminated and continued to see use. However, pile number one remained with some 1,700 fire damaged cartridges left in the pile core. The reactor was sealed off and the reactor tank itself remained sealed with some 15 tonnes of uranium. Although pile two was not affected by the fire, it too was shut down and the construction of air-cooled reactors hasn't happened since. The site is still active being renamed Sellafield and is being used for fuel reprocessing, whilst reactors at both Windscale, including Pile 1 and Calder, are being decommissioned. Thank you very much for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please leave comments down below, I always like new suggestions. And once again, thank you so much for us reaching 10,000 subscribers. And all that's left to say is thank you very much for watching.